This is a University of Otago podcast. Good evening. Um, my name is Harleen Hain, and I am the Vice Chancellor here at the University of Otago. And as always, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to this inaugural professorial lecture. Um, this is the first IPL to kick off our 2015 season, and I'm extremely pleased that we are beginning our season by celebrating the promotion of a professor in humanities. Now, many of you know um, that my highest degree is actually in sciences, but my very first degree was a Bachelor of Arts. I was actually blessed to spend the first four years of my tertiary education um, marinated in a liberal arts curriculum that was steeped in humanities. And more than 30 years later, I remain a very fierce champion of the value of this kind of education. Now, like many of you who are in the audience this evening, I see a very worrying trend in New Zealand and other parts of the world in which attempts are being made to shift the focus uh, of a university education away from a broad-based liberal arts background to more utilitarian job training. There seems to be a considerable amount of unfounded rhetoric about the financial value of certain kinds of degrees and pursuits over others, with very little recognition at the same time that students who study the humanities find successful, satisfying, and financially beneficial employment both here in New Zealand and around the world. You might be interested to know that one third of all Fortune 500 CEOs in the world right now currently hold BAs, and so does the Finance Minister and Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand. Now, in addition, um, all successful careers, including medicine, law, and business, require critical thinking, teamwork, and sensitivity to cultural and political perspectives. And as we are all well aware, the humanities provide essential grounding in these areas. Many of our Otago graduates will pursue their careers overseas, and those who master the language, the literature, the art, the religion, and the politics of their new home will fare far better than those who do not. For all these reasons, and many, many, many more, here at Otago, we fiercely support the importance of humanities in preparing young people, not only for careers, but also for life in the 21st century. So tonight, we have all come together to celebrate the academic achievements of a man who actually embodies my aspirations for all students here at the University of Otago. Professor Shogeman is an outstanding scholar who has made a significant contribution to the study of comparative political thought. His book on William of Ockham was a landmark achievement. It has been described as a masterpiece of its genre and as, and as deeply researched, lucidly written, and succinctly presented. I am sure that the subject of that book, William of Ockham himself, would have applauded the author in much the same way that we will this evening. On behalf of the University of Otago, I would like to warmly congratulate um, Professor Shogeman on his well-earned promotion to professor and I will now call on Professor Tony Ballantyne to tell us a little bit more about the journey that he took to get here. Thank you very much. Tina Koto Katsuo. It is with great pleasure that I introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Takashi Shogerman. Takashi is a greatly valued member of the Department of History and Art History. He is an influential and highly productive historian, an excellent teacher and supervisor, and an important leader in our department and also in our division, where he is Associate Dean of Research. He is quite simply, I think, a fine historian and a great colleague. Staff and students from our department are delighted to be here tonight to recognize and celebrate the caliber of his work, both as a research scholar and as a teacher and supervisor. Takashi was born and raised in the city of Yokohama, Japan's great port city, and given the trajectory of his subsequent career, that location seems very apposite. 
as from the 1850s, Yokohama was and has been a key site for cross-cultural encounter and intellectual exchange. Takashi's father was a physician and his mother a homemaker, but both of his parents placed great value on learning. During his schooling, Takashi became very interested in the so-called Warring States period of Japanese history. During this turbulent age of civil war from 1467 to 1603, fortifications proliferated in Japan and many great castles were constructed. And it was these castles that captured the imagination of young Takashi Shogunman. His parents encouraged this interest, taking him to many castles, especially in Western Japan. Takashi was so passionate about these castles, he became able to identify each by the distinctive style of masonry and the layering of the stones that the skilled artisans used in their construction. While at high school, his intellectual interests broadened beyond masonry, and he began to take shape as he, as he read the work of some of Japan's leading thinkers and social scientists in the post-war period. And it was at that stage he first began to dream of being a humanities scholar or a researcher in the social sciences. He entered Keio University in 1986, a very distinguished institution that has been at the forefront of modern Japan's educational system. Takashi pursued a degree in law, and having Takashi as a colleague, I think we can still see this in his forensic thinking and very careful exposition of his ideas and his writing. Those legal studies were interrupted or suspended for a year while Takashi went to, Japan, uh, to Canada, to the University of Toronto, to study English as a second language. After graduating from Keio University in 1991, he went to Britain to pursue graduate work at the University of Sheffield under the supervision of the eminent medievalist, Professor David Luscombe. His dissertation explored the thought of William of Ockham, the 14th century English uh, scholastic philosopher and theologian, and particularly focused on the ways in which Ockham's work, particularly his theory of heresy, could be understood as a contribution to political thought. That work has been the foundation for much of Takashi's later research and was developed into his very important monograph that uh, Professor Hayne alluded to, Ockham and Political Discourse in the Late Middle, Middle Ages, which was published in Cambridge University Press's very distinguished series, Studies in Life and Thought. From that foundation, Takashi's career has flourished, and I think he's developed into quite an unusual historian. And I think he's unusual for a couple of reasons. Firstly, his work is deeply grounded in two quite distinct fields. I think a more uh, predictable trajectory for a scholar from that kind of start would be to find another late medieval thinker and write a monograph on that. But Takashi has taken, I think, a wider vision and a, a more unusual uh, trajectory. He's not confined himself to the study of late medieval political thought, instead developing an impressive arc of work on Japanese intellectual history. This has led to a range of articles and chapters on modern Japanese thought, and to a recent book that explored the freedom of speech and university of autonomy in Japan during the 1930s. And of course, those questions remain live for many of us. But Takashi has not simply been content with pursuing two distinct research tracks, medieval Europe and modern Japanese intellectual history, but rather he has laced together his knowledge of these two fields in interesting ways. Firstly, he has written a sequence of works exploring European intellectual traditions and political thought for a specifically Japanese market. Most notably, and in his 2013 book in Japanese, whose English title is The Birth of European Political Thought, he explains the emergence and significance of a specifically European tradition of political thinking at the turn of the 13th and 14th centuries for a Japanese audience. That book is very important, and it won the very prestigious Suntory Prize for Social Sciences and the Humanities in Japan, and that's a, an award of true national significance. Of course, as many of you know, Suntory is perhaps Japan's most famous whiskey company. And perhaps there is an opening here in New Zealand, given that our New Zealand Post Book Awards have lapsed for 2015. 
In addition to analyzing and translating European intellectual history for a Japanese audience, Takashi has also undertaken explicitly comparative work. Here, he has been particularly interested in bringing European and uh, Asian understandings of peace into a comparative analytical frame, and more recently to think comparatively about the nature of patriotism. This kind of important comparative work has been supported by the Marsden Fund of the Royal Society of New Zealand, and Takashi's held both a fast start and a full Marsden grant. Here at Otago, he has championed the possibilities of cross-cultural analysis, organising conferences on political thought and cultures of peace, and providing leadership for the university's research theme on comparative and cross-cultural studies. Now, I've suggested that this impressive range of research expertise and activity means that Takashi is unusual. He is also unusual, I think, because of his age. The history of political thought really is a shrinking field, and many of its important exponents who have taught us so much have retired or are near retirement, and often they're not being replaced. I think here at Otago, we're very fortunate to have Takashi introducing our students to these crucially important thinkers, texts, and arguments. And Takashi is at the forefront of this field, and his work is breathing new life into it. He is opening up important new analytical vantage points. In addition to pursuing the possibilities of comparative analysis, his work more recently has turned to the possibilities that cognitive linguistics offers scholars of political thought. And I think that is further evidence of an inventive and innovative mind at work. I will stop now and let you hear that innovative mind at work. Please welcome Professor Takashi Shogunin. Well, th thank you very much, Tony, for the very uh, generous uh, words of introduction. And I wanted to, uh, I would like to thank uh, the rest of the academic uh, party, uh, Vice Chancellor, Professor Malachny and Professor Squire for being here this evening. And may I thank you all for coming uh, this evening. Um, it's very nice to uh, see so many of you uh, here this evening. And before I proceed, I would like to um, um, express my uh, thanks to my colleagues in the Department of History and Art History for their unfailing support over the years. And also I would like to uh, acknowledge my um, friends and colleagues who are overseas. Especially uh, I would like to single out six individuals, namely David Luscombe, Konstantin Fasolt, Kerry Netherman, Michiko Arima, Nayang Guo and Stephen Conway. Well, just a moment ago, Professor Ballantyne kindly outlined my academic career thus far. And after hearing that, you might uh, wonder why I have been working on a disparate topics. When I was still a postgraduate student at the University of Sheffield, a number of people used to ask me, why on earth do you work on a dead monk? <laughs> now, the boot is on the other foot. Uh, since I have been known as a medievalist for nearly two decades now, when some realize that I also work on Japanese topics, they ask, why do you work on Japanese history? So I think some justification is due. In this lecture, I propose to offer a personal reflection on how and why I came to, um, to um, to work to, to study intellectual history, especially the history of political thought in both Western Europe and Japan. But obviously, I don't wish my talk to be too personal or trivial and to be of interest to anyone but myself. Uh, rather, through a personal reflection, I would like to address an issue of a contemporary relevance in the academy, at least in the Anglophone world, uh, that is, the so-called crisis of humanities. Of course, I shall not make any audacious claim that I have a solution to the crisis. My ambition is far more modest in that, through a reflection of the trajectory of my academic formation, I hope to highlight some points that I think are worth considering 
in relation to the contemporary problems surrounding humanities. So I am only aiming to provide food for thought from the viewpoint of an intellectual historian for those who care about the future of research and teaching in humanities. Okay, so let me begin by sketching what I have been doing in my research in intellectual history. My work has revolved around two pillars. One is the history of political thought in medieval Europe and the other is the history of political thought in modern Japan. I began my academic career with the research in the political thought of William of Ockham, the 14th century Franciscan theologian. My study highlighted Ockham's theory of heresy and his program of descent from heretical popes. Ockham was originally a theologian and a logician at Oxford who did not write anything about politics. However, when he was asked by his superior to examine papal bulls which condemned the Franciscan ideal of evangelical poverty, he realized that the contemporary pope had fallen into heresy. Withdrawn, withdrawn from papal obedience, Ockham was excommunicated. Exiled in Munich, uh, he produced a general theory of heresy and envisaged a program of legitimate dissent from the heretical pope. And on that basis, he wrote anti-papal polemical works to warn contemporary Christians of the danger of papal heresy. So I offered a new interpretation of Ockham as a political thinker who attempted to rescue the autonomy and freedom of individuals from unjust political power, such as that of a heretical pope. My more recent work is a historical narrative of medieval European political thought for the Japanese audience. The book entitled The Birth of European Political Thought examines a historical, a historical process whereby political thought emerged in medieval Christendom. Historians of political thought who work on the modern period uh, often argue that there was no such thing as political thought in the Middle Ages because in the medieval Europe there was nothing comparable to the modern state. Typically, Medieval political thought took the form of ecclesiology, that is, the theory of church government. Supposing that political thought is necessarily secular, one would struggle to find, to, uh, find any intellectually significant attempt to theorize politics in the medieval world. Meanwhile, it was precisely in the Middle Ages that the unified culture emerged in the geographical region which we today call Europe. Generations of medieval historians from Henri Piran and Christopher Dawson to Jacques Le Goff and Robert Bartlett have firmly established that the ancient Roman Empire was not Europe. Europe as a cultural unit was born in the Middle Ages. In my book, I try to answer the question, what kind of political thinking emerged in the time when the unified culture appeared in the geographical area that is today called Europe? I responded to this question by tracing two types of discursive traditions. One is the, um, the, the emergence and the development of ecclesiological discourses on power. That is, uh, it was theological and legal scholarship in the medieval church that generated sophisticated theories of power. The other tradition I highlighted, I, uh, highlighted wa was the arise of the theory about a civil community under the influence not only of Aristotle and Cicero but also of ancient Roman medical scientist Galen. The metaphor of the body politic which was prevalent in the Middle Ages constituted an interface between um, medical understanding of the human body and the political understanding of the civil community. In other words, new theories of the political community in the Middle Ages were modeled on the new physiological understanding of the human body. Now, in this argument, methodologically, I have been developing a new approach to intellectual history 
by deploying the cognitive linguistic theory of metaphor. Metaphor is not just a figurative language. It, con uh, it constitutes um, a construal of one conceptual domain in light of another. The metaphor of the body politic, therefore, represents the understanding of the structure and function of the political community in, like, in, in light of those of human body. And what follows from this is that the metaphor of the body politic helps us hypothesize that political thinkers in the past deployed medical knowledge in order to conceptualize the political community in the likeness of the human body. So I have been exploring a new method whereby metaphor constitutes a clue for reconstructing an intellectual context, in my case, the medical context of political theorizing. Um, I, I'd like to touch upon the second pillar of my work briefly. Uh, that is the study of the history of Japanese political thought. Much of my research has revolved around political ideas in wartime Japan in the 1930s and 40s. I have especially focused on the life and work of Tadao Yanaihara, um, an economist and a Christian thinker. A professor of colonial policy at the Imperial University of Tokyo, he wrote extensively to examine contemporary Japanese colonial policy in Taiwan, Manchuria, and the South Pacific, and also to attack the chauvinistic um, nationalism and the militarism of contemporary government. I have examined his discussions of patriotism and the pacifism um, in contemporary intellectual and, uh, and uh, political contexts. Also, my recent book in Japanese offered a micro-historical analysis of the event where in 1937, Yanaihara was forced to resign from the university due to the controversial, that is, pacifist uh, extramural speech. The suppression of, of his speech did not come only from the government, media, and even the colleague uh, at the university contributed to the expulsion of this liberal academic. So the suppression of freedom of speech is a complex phenomenon and university autonomy is indeed very difficult to defend when the state and society are going mad. So my work crosses geographical, cultural and temporal boundaries and crossing boundaries is quite natural to me because I don't think that the boundaries are given. They are artificial and fictional. Disciplinary boundaries in particular result merely from utilitarian arrangement for the division of labor. New questions have given birth to new disciplines and existing disciplines are constantly changing in response to changing questions. So although it is customary to identify ourselves as historians, political scientists, literary scholars, and so forth, our own inquiries should not be dictated primarily uh, by the needs of the discipline. Rather, it should be driven by questions because the discipline is the result, not the origin, of knowledge which is generated in response to questions. Now, as for me, Enquiring into the history of European and Japanese political thought is consciously dictated by two generic questions. One concerns the cultural specificity of political thinking. I am exploring the cultural characteristics of political theorizing with special reference to Western Europe and Japan. So what is distinctively European about European political thought and what is characteristically Japanese about Japanese political ideas. One cannot appreciate an intellectual tradition's distinctiveness unless one compares it with another. So an exploration into the cultural specificity of European political thinking requires comparison. And in my case, this has been the Japanese tradition. The other question that dictates my inquiries concerns the dissenting tradition. 
political theory is, in one respect, a theoretical pursuit of political ideals. Political theorists conceptualize their normative theories through critical engagement uh, with a wide range of political visions, such as liberalism, republicanism, communitarianism, feminism, socialism, and so forth. By contrast, I am more interested in how political thinkers theorized unjust, tyrannical, or diseased government, and how and why they legitimized dissent from it. Occam was a dissenter in 14th century Europe, while Yanaihara was a dissenter in 20th century Japan. The context in which they, the two men operated were entirely different, yet they both wrestled with the same question of legitimate dissent from unjust power. So how did I come to focus on these questions? Well, in retrospect, I don't think I did so in my postgraduate years. I was immersed in the British tradition of intellectual history in most of 1990s, and I owe a great deal to the academic training at the University of Sheffield in terms of research skills and methodology. However, in terms of my academic mindset and questions, I cannot help thinking that I am ultimately a son of Japanese scholarship. My fundamental attitude to academic inquiry was shaped profoundly by the undergraduate education at Keio University in Tokyo. I am delighted to be able to talk with sincere gratitude about two teachers at Keio University, uh, Professor Seiji Sumi and the late Professor Katsumi Nakamura. Uh, professor Sumi was professor of the history of political thought and one of the few specialists, of, uh, specialists in the medieval European political thought in Japan. Uh, he advised me to continue studying for postgraduate degrees and choose medieval European political thought as my specialized area. Professor Nakamura was the professor of economic history and his specialized area was the history of uh, early modern English economic and social thought. And I can say gratefully that I am indebted to them for my two key research questions. Professor Sumi inspired me to investigate into the cultural specificity of political thinking, and Professor Nakamura cultivated my interest in the dissenting tradition. Now, what is common to both professors and is deeply inspiring to me about their teaching is that they lectured on their specialized area with frequent references to modern Japan. Their historical discussions on European intellectual history were often connected with their critical observations on modern Japanese politics, economy, and society. This is not to say, to be sure, that they turned the classroom into the uh, place for political campaigning. They never uh, commented on any specific policy issues. Rather, they often highlighted long-term structural problems with politics, society, and the economy in modern Japan. Professor Sumi often discussed the fragility of Japanese democracy in light of modern European political ideas, while Professor Nakamura lectured on the origin of modern capitalism and discerned what German sociologist Max Weber called pariah capitalism, that is, the, um, the pursuit of wealth by antisocial and unethical means in the practice of contemporary Japanese capitalism. Notice that, that they taught me in the late 1980s. This was a time when the Japanese economy was at its zenith. Some commentators even argued seriously that the 21st century would belong to Japan. The two professors, by contrast, criticized the contemporary practice of Japanese democracy and capitalism and reflected anxiously on their future. 
and their lectures, so their lectures demonstrated that historical insights could lead to foresight into political economy of their own times. But you might wonder about the present tense tendency of such undergraduate lectures on intellectual history. And indeed, historicism requires historians to restrict their inquiries into the past without reference to the present. So the lectures by the two professors I'm talking about clearly manifested a tension between the historicist scrutiny of past ideas and the philosophical concerns with the present. But their presentist impulse did not originate in an anachronistic desire to see the past through the, the prism of the present. Rather, the two professors' concerns with the present manifested their ambition to shed new light on the present from the perspective excavated from the past. So they represented past ideas, which may be alien to us moderns, in order to gain alternative perspectives onto the present. Viewed from another perspective, their lectures did not merely communicate knowledge. Their concerns with the present suggest that their scholarly engagement did not constitute merely the production and communication of knowledge, but was intended to serve the purpose beyond the pursuit of new historical knowledge. Now, to clarify my point, let me give you an example. Uh, one of the key lessons they taught is that while it is absolutely crucial uh, to, to, to be well versed in existing scholarship in the field, one should not delve into research simply because a certain topic presents itself as a gap in the current research or because a certain set of archival materials has not been examined previously. A gap in the scholarship does not necessarily mean that it is worth filling it. <laughs> the fact that a set of archival materials has remained unexamined does not ipso facto mean that it, it is worth exploring. So the key question here is, is it worth knowing? Indeed, some topics may not have been explored because they are not significant enough. So the choice of research topics and questions is inseparable uh, from some kind of value judgment. We can certainly think of a variety of standards by which to make value judgments uh, on the choice of research topic, but I just would like to single out one issue. Uh, some of you might wonder how the two professors I'm talking about thought of value neutrality in their scholarly inquiries. Like many Japanese social scientists of their generation, they were Weberian. They both embraced Max Weber's idea of Wertfreiheit, the value-free academic inquiry. Indeed, when they examined their object of historical inquiry in their monographs and their research papers, they did so dispassionately to observe value neutrality. However, studying historical objects dispassionately in the Weberian value-free fashion they underscored does not necessarily mean that the researchers should not make any value judgment at all. Professor Nakamura conveyed this idea by an interesting metaphor. He said, one must learn how to read what is written before the front cover of a monograph. Obviously, nothing is written physically uh, before the front cover because there's nothing. What Professor Nakamura meant was that one should be able to read what value judgments motivated the author to write the book, even if the author does not make that motivation explicit in the book. That is a tacit assumption on which the study is predicated. What I would like to underline here is that the two professors, I think, did not teach their academic disciplines merely as an intellectual exercise. They tried to show that there are existential dimensions to research in historical scholarship. 
asking certain questions in historical inquiries should not derive from mere interest or love of knowledge. Historical research ought to be anchored in the researcher's fundamental outlook on human life in our own times. And that outlook is a sine qua non because historical studies are unlike many in the natural science, many disciplines in natural sciences, inseparable from the question of human conditions and values. In the case of the other two professors I have been talking about, their research into European intellectual tradition was clearly motivated by the disastrous experience of modern Japan, which culminated in 1945. From the middle of the 19th century, Japan transformed itself in a very short period of time into a modern nation state. The reception of Western institutions, customs and technologies was a top priority for Japanese government and society. But the rapid westernization and modernization also led to the rise of chauvinistic nationalism and aggressive militarism, among other things. The two professors experienced the demise of militarist Japan in their youth. So they desire to understand what went wrong with the modernization of Japan. So their research in European intellectual history was thus close, closely rooted in their life experience. But they approached European intellectual traditions differently. Professor Sumi explored the cultural specificity of European political thinking because he desired to understand European culture in contrast with something European which became an alter ego of modern Japan. Professor Nakamura turned to excavate the dissenting tradition which would counter pat patrimonialism which survived in modern Japan. Despite their differing approaches, however, they shared a common concern. Their scholarly research was motivated by the question of the demise of modern Japan in 1945, which underpinned their cautious hope for new ideals in post-war Japan. So their research into the European historical world was integral to their active commitment, active engagement with the world in which they lived. And I find it fascinating that academic research, which is deeply motivated by personal experience, is not reduced to the, a pursuit of the strictly personal, which frankly no one else cares about, but is instead tied to a moral and civic commitment to illuminate the problems of their day. However, precisely because their academic work was ultimately rooted in personal experience and conviction, what ultimately motivated them to study was only implied in lectures and was certainly not mentioned explicitly in their books. That was indeed written before the front cover. Meditating on lessons that the two teachers taught me, I would like to single out three points that may be worth pondering for the present and the future for research and teaching in humanities from a viewpoint of an intellectual historian. First, I think that the lifeline for humanities consists in our ability to show to the public how and why our research really matters today but obviously this cannot be achieved by claiming merely that our work is cool or interesting. The ultimate outlook to human life that underpins research, I think, determines to a considerable degree how and to what extent our research sheds new light on human conditions and values that are meaningful in the present. Often, however, our research is influenced and dictated by mundane needs, such as performance evaluation of various kinds. So the research productivity can even become an objective in itself, unfortunately, um, which might make ourselves blind to the ultimate purpose for which we engage in research. 
So reflecting on what our research means, not only to ourselves, but also to people around us, and why we study what we have been studying, perhaps helps us, helps us not only to be relevant, but also to remain sane. <laughs> Second, uh, reflecting on the legacy of my two teachers reminds me of the importance of lectures in the undergraduate program. Small classes with lots of hands-on exercises might be more efficient um, in communicating knowledge accurately. However, most knowledge become out of date quickly. Indeed, I can hardly recall anything about courses from undergraduate days that only communicated knowledge. So undergraduate teaching, I think, it should be more than infusing knowledge. Cardinal Newman famously claimed when asked about the end of university education, I quote, knowledge is capable of being its own end. This assertion, however, may require qualification in our time of hyper-specialization, where more and more is known about less and less. Both teachers and the students are facing the tsunami of ever-increasing specialized knowledge. And in such an environment, it is crucial for a teacher to help students not only to gain important knowledge, but also to understand the problems that the, the knowledge presents in the present. And in lectures, a teacher should lay out systematically not only knowledge that the students should know, but also the meaning and the significance of the knowledge in the context where both the teacher and the students are situated. And in such lectures, students will learn not only facts and the theories, but also questions that are worth asking. And through such lectures, teachers not only communicate knowledge, but also inspire. Third, it is important to acknowledge our own standpoint in the communication of our research. Obviously, there is no such thing as a global standpoint. We are necessarily situated somewhere in the globe, and we are also in the present, not in the past or in the future. My two teachers lived and worked in Japan, mainly in the second half of the 20th century, as Japanese citizens. They taught Japanese students predominantly and wrote for the Japanese audience. Hence, they asked questions that are tied to the historical destiny of modern Japan. But they are not the context in which I live my academic life. At a certain point in the past, I made a decision to live my life in the Anglophone world, and that decision eventually took me to this country. As a result, a vast majority of my students are Pākehā New Zealanders. My work in English is read by academics and students in the relevant field in the West and elsewhere, while my work in Japanese is read by the academic and informed lay audience in Japan. Clearly, as an author and a teacher, I am situated in multiple contexts which my teachers did not know. Therefore, Although I inherited fundamental questions from my two teachers, I should not answer their questions in their ways. The questions must be digested fully to be entirely mine and must be answered in my own way. If I take to heart their lesson that academic research and historical inquiries should be ultimately rooted in some sort of existential motivations. So my challenge is threefold. Uh, first, I write works in English for the audience in the West in response to my first question, that is the cultural specificity of a political thinking. This way, I seek to understand the cultural distinctiveness of the tradition of political thinking in the West, uh, in Western Europe and Japan, thereby modestly contributing to the historical self-understanding of readers in, the, in, in, in Western Europe and Japan. Although ultimately it is rooted in my personal desire for historical, cultural and political self-understanding 
as an individual who was born and bred in modern Japan. Second, I write works in Japanese for the audience in Japan in response to my second question, that is, descent from unjust rule. This way, I aspire to disseminate knowledge and understanding of the dissenting traditions, which, in my view, is relatively weak in modern Japan. But that is not the only reason why I single out the dissenting tradition. Dissent is a form of resistance to injustice. Resistance to injustice, whether it be of earthly powers, a majority of society, or even the divinity, is an undercurrent of European culture, which was crystallized long before Europe emerged in Antigone of Sophocles, one of the three ancient Greek tragedians. Hence, my second question is in fact a key leading me to the first. And third and finally, as a teacher at this institution, I hope to continue teaching European history, especially European uh, medieval uh, intellectual tradition and political ideas, in order to serve the pedagogical purpose for students which uh, who, in my view, ought to learn about the European pursuit of ideals and values, such as the authority of individual conscience, which is a main theme I aim to explore through inquiries into my fundamental questions. But one might ask how useful it is to teach and learn such things as the pursuit of the authority of individual conscience in European history, especially in connection with employability and business-related skills of students? My response would be as follows. I don't think that history teaching is merely about infusing knowledge and skills. History serves a variety of other purposes. The great English historian R.H. Tawney once wrote, what is certain is that issues which were thought to have been buried by the discretion of centuries have shown in our day that they were not dead, but sleeping. To examine the forms which they have assumed and the phases through which they have passed, even in the narrow field of a single country and a limited time, is not mere antiquarianism. It is to summon the living, not to invoke a corpse, and to see from a new angle the problem of our, day, of, of our own age by widening the experience brought to their consideration. So studying history is thinking about issues which men and women in the past wrestled with, uh, wrestled with in contexts different from our own. And the same issues emerge repeatedly to the surface of human history in different forms and contexts. The question of the authority of individual conscience is indeed one such issue which was addressed and examined again and again in European intellectual history. But remember, the authority of the individual conscience was discussed, especially when it came under threat. In the European past, it was attacked by religious authority and political power. Today, it is subject to the threat of economic power. And one such symptom is that the discourse prevalent today in universities and in societies around the world subjugates the university's research and teaching to economic values and judges academic disciplines in light of economic benefit and efficiency. The modern world has witnessed what Max Weber once called the unceasing struggle of deities. As long as a variety of values such as political, economic, intellectual, religious, aesthetic, and many others remain mutually in tension, human life in a society maintains healthy, if precarious, balance. In our world of global capitalism, however, economic values such as profit and efficiency penetrate and dominate every aspect of human life. The encroachment of economic values and language is now witnessed in academia as well. But obviously, 
the university is not primarily a business corporation that pursues and enshrines profit. The purpose of the university is primarily the intellectual pursuit of knowledge and for that end, we university academics value academic freedom. Academic work as a pursuit of intellectual rationality requires freedom of research and teaching. I shall not delve into the conceptual intricacies of academic freedom. Suffice to say, it is largely accepted that the freedom, academic freedom is a necessary condition for the intellectual pursuit of knowledge which serves the public good of a society and ultimately of humankind. But the public good that academic freedom serves is often construed today as being merely economic. As a result, it is increasingly prevalent to evaluate academic research and teaching in terms of economic sustainability and profit. And this argument in turn puts a question mark on the legitimacy of academic disciplines which have little impact on the national economy. It is highly problematic that this view subjugates academic research and teach, teaching to economic values because the legitimacy and the raison d'etre of academic disciplines should be judged primarily on academic grounds and ought to be free from the sway of economic or political power. And that is in one important respect what academic freedom is about. Attack on humanities on the basis of economic uselessness is indeed a threat to academic freedom. Seen in this light, the so-called crisis of humanities is not a problem for humanities alone. It is symptomatic of a crisis for the university as a whole if academic freedom genuinely remains the supreme value that we collectively uphold. American academics are acutely conscious that academic freedom has been under fire since the, Bo since the time of the Bush administration. Legal philosopher Robert Post, literary theorist Stanley Fish, historian Joan W. Scott, and the philosopher Judith Butler, among many others, have been engaging in vigorous debate on academic freedom in recent years. New Zealand is rather unique in that authoritative answers to the questions regarding aspects of academic freedom are provided legally in the Education Act of 1989. However, the fact that the idea of academic freedom is legally written down obviously does not dispel all potential threats. Furthermore, the history of academic freedom suggests that it is often very difficult to defend it. And the defense of academic freedom is the onus with which humanities scholars ought to bear, precisely because it is typically humanities scholarship which has questioned and reshaped human conditions and values, including academic freedom. Humanities researchers are facing a challenge. The first step towards overcoming the problem of our day, I think, is to ensure that we do not lose sight of the ultimate purpose of our individual academic inquiries. That is, to ask ourselves what is written before the front cover of our own monographs. Thank you very much. Many thanks to Kashi for an absolutely fantastic lecture. Uh, Professor Shogerman has offered a compelling account of his own intellectual formation, and I think this kind of reflection is tremendously valuable. It not only provides rich insights into how monographs or individual monographs and larger fields of inquiry take shape, but it also reminds us of the forces that shape the kind of work that we do in the academy. I think in particular this lecture has been a particularly rich appreciation of the ways in which we are moulded by our teachers, or Takashi in particular, moulded by two teachers and by supervisors. In his case, Professors Nakamura and Sumi. 
And I, that really reminds us, I think, of the very important intellectual but also personal freight that attends our roles as academics and teachers in universities. So I think a kind of public recitation of this type of intellectual whakapapa, if you like, uh, is tremendously useful for all of us. And we thank you for that, Takashi. Of course, Takashi has also made a very strong case for the significance of the discipline of humanities, even though he reminds us that he's not a disciplinarian first, uh, for the humanities as a whole, and particularly for the importance of humanities' role in shoring up academic freedom. In terms of his own work, he has also explored the deeper epistemological and cultural questions that have framed his research and offered a compelling argument that steers us away from either a narrow historicism where the past is understood purely on its own terms, an approach that can easily slide antiquar into antiquarianism, or on the other hand, he is warned against a mechanical presentism where the past is only mobilized as a tool to intervene in contemporary political debate and cultural contestation. He points us to a rich and fertile middle ground for historians and for other scholars in the humanities. Now, I say other scholars very carefully because Takashi has stressed to us that he is driven pri by the primacy of his research questions rather than by disciplinary identity. This reflects something else that Takashi has acknowledged tonight, that he is a boundary crosser. His willingness to, be to move between analytical sites, between periods of intellectual production and reception, and between different idioms of political thought means that his work has been prominent in discussions about the possibilities of a genuinely comparative and a truly global history of ideas. And I think that's an incredibly important project. So tonight, we are really celebrating the fruits of those intellectual journeys. And we look forward to seeing where those analytical voyages will take his scholarship in the future. But we are also celebrating the fact that he is ours, to use his term, that he is situated here. That is from here that his scholarship may venture far and wide, but it is anchored in this place and that we can count him as our valued colleague, teacher and supervisor here at the University of Otago. So thank you, Takashi.